Colossians chapter 1. Last week we finished our study through the book of Haggai, and we're going to take a little bit of a break uh, for the holiday season and go through a series that I'm calling uh, Peace on Earth. And we're coming up on that time of year that always brings out the conflict, right? There's nothing like gathering around a Thanksgiving turkey or a Christmas ham to bring out family conflict, right? And as those of us who follow the Prince of Peace, we, we are called uh, to be a people of peace. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be under his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And then we jump to the New Testament in Matthew 5, 9, and we read, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. So as followers of Jesus, one of the things that we should be striving for is to be a people of peace. But the reality is that one thing is inevitable in this life until Jesus comes back, and that's what? Conflict, right? And that's why it's important for us to be Peacemaker. So we're going we're gonna to spend a couple of weeks and dive into what it means to have peace on earth and to be an agent of that peace on earth. What it looks like for us to handle conflict biblically so that we can be the peacemakers that God wants us to be. So we can hear, blessed are we the peacemakers. It's important that we get out in front of conflict and know how to handle it before it happens. So that's why we're starting today, not the day after Christmas, not the day after Thanksgiving, right? We're, we're going to try to get out in front of it. And, and ultimately, this is the, the challenge for you is going to be to change. It's, it's always the challenge of a good sermon. But there's going to be some very practical steps along the way marked by some holidays to give you some homework to go and actually do what we're teaching you how to do over the next few weeks. And my hope is that this series will give us a, a framework of peace that we're all comfortable with, that, that we understand and we, we have a good working knowledge of it so that we're able to then deal with conflict when it arises, because it is going to arise. Not just during the holiday season, but year-round, it is going to arise. And the reality is, as long as we are human beings in this building, as long as there are people in this world, there will be conflict until Jesus returns. So it's important for us to know not only how to deal with it. Guys, this is, this is important. I don't want you to just know how to deal with it. I want to teach you how to make the most of it. I want you to see that conflict is a good thing, not a bad thing. But we live in a time that is increasingly marked by conflict. You, you used to, I remember growing up and thinking, you know, you, you would see all of these things, these people having civil wars and divisions in other countries thinking, wow, I'm glad we're not like them. Fast forward to today. We're dividing over every single thing you can imagine. And even a few things you can't imagine. It's happening right here in our own backyard. The conflict has drawn closer and closer to us as Americans. But the reality is conflict has been around since the beginning of mankind. And we see that in the garden with Adam and Eve, the very first conflict that brought sin into the world that has caused all of the additional conflict that we deal with throughout church history. And if you study church history much, you will see there are lots of conflicts that arose. Do you realize most of what you hold dear in your hands this morning came from conflict? 
all of the Gospels in the New Testament are about conflict. Man's problem with God and his resolution. Then get to the pastoral epistles. You know why Paul wrote those letters? Because somebody was being stupid. <laughs> but aren't you thankful for that scripture that you hold in your hands? All of that came from conflict. So out of conflict comes really beautiful things. I want to read to you one of the things that come out of, of some early conflict in church history. It says this, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and all things visible and invisible, and in the one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all, all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried the third day he rose again, according to scriptures, he ascended to heaven in a, in a seated, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one universal and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead until life in the world and, and to life in the world to come. This was the document that was put out by the Council of Nicaea in AD 325. And the reason that we have that document and, and those beautiful words that our church fathers believed is because of conflict. You see, there was this pastor named Arius, and he was down in Alexandria, part of Egypt. And Egypt being a place that was polytheistic, believing in many gods and multiple gods, Arius became concerned that the Trinitarian view might be confused with being polytheistic. In other words, people thinking about the Trinity might think, oh, well, they just believe in multiple gods too. And so he decided that upon his understanding and his reading of Scripture, that Jesus was actually not God. He did not exist with him eternally, but instead was a created being. And this was going to be his answer for defending against polytheism. The problem was, he wasn't just one little preacher in one little place, but his idea began to spread amongst the whole church. And as ideas spread, the church had to decide what they were going to do about this new idea, this new philosophy being taught about the nature of Jesus Christ. So the church calls a council. Uh, the first one was the Council of Jerusalem. You might remember that. Uh, Council of Jerusalem, if you've ever studied through the book of Acts, uh, that's where most of us got admitted into the church. Uh, again, there, there was a conflict. Another conflict arose, and the conflict was, can Gentiles be part of the church, or is this just a Jewish thing only? Did Jesus come to save the nation of Israel or the entire world? And because of that conflict, the church gets together, and they have a council, and they vote, and they decide, no, the gospel is for all of us. And out of that, comes, uh, that conflict comes the introduction and the open arms of Gentiles into the church. Well, out of the council of Nicaea and this heresy that is being pushed that Jesus is not actually God, he's not actually deity, but instead he's a created being, although Arius would argue, if he were here, that he's the first created being. He still argues that he was a created being. And so the church does what the church does. It, it comes together. And it has a council. And they read the scriptures. And they pray. And they talk. And they argue. And out of that 
comes that statement that I just read to you affirming the Trinitarian view that we hold to this day. And without that conflict, we wouldn't have those beautiful words written by the early church fathers in AD 325 to understand where they stood. Right? We, we could argue and say, well, we think they believed in that, but we don't have to argue, right? We know exactly what they believe because they wrote it down. Why did they have to write it down? Because of a conflict, because somebody was preaching something wrong. See, we look at conflict so many times and we just see the negative. We just see the bad and we think, oh, I want to avoid conflict at all costs. But the reality is, if you study history, it is out of such conflict comes so much beauty and understanding about God and Christianity and His church. And this morning, we're going to study the passage that Arius based his view off of. And I want to look at that passage and kind of let you be, or excuse me, let this be one of the the cornerstones of what we're going to talk about in this series of peace on earth. Because the first thing we have to understand about peace and being peacemakers is that we didn't ultimately make the peace. Somebody else did. And because somebody else did, it's our job, it's our responsibility to follow that model that's set out for us by the Father. So we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15. We'll put this up on the screen and feel free to read along with me. He is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So let's walk through this scripture this morning. And as we do, just, um, I'm just going to hit some uh, highlights. I want to be very upfront with you. Um, these verses are packed with weeks of sermons, okay? So, so I, I'm going to be dealing with a couple of little things, but there's so much here that, that is being said. So I'm not going to try to cover the whole passage this morning. Otherwise, we'd be here all day. But I want to hit some important truths. Most theologians call this the hymn of Christ. And they see it broken into two stanzas. So in other words, uh, the writer of Colossians is pulling in a song that's being sung in the church and applying it to Christ and and what he has done and the preeminence of Christ. And so the first stanza is verses 15 through 17, and the second stanza of the song is 18 through 20. It's important to know that because when we read the Bible, we, we often get misunderstandings because we take things too literally, not understanding the style of literature that is being written, right? So, so when we read the Psalms, which are a collection of songs, there, there's going to be more metaphors there, right? We're not literally taking the absolute meaning of that word. We're looking and backing up and going, well, what is, what is the author trying to communicate here so that I can understand it? I would argue the same thing with the book of Revelation. That's a form of literature called apocalyptic literature, that, that literature genre existed at the time in which it was written. It was not meant to be literal. So, some people have, have developed whole systems of theology around literal interpretations of the book of Revelation. Folks, that's just dangerous. 
And the same thing has happened here, I believe, in this passage. And that's my goal is to set out to show you how Arius did that with this passage. Now, this hymn was, again, known in the church at the time. Paul is incorporating it here so that we would understand and see the the preeminence of Christ in creation. And so he begins in verse 15 by saying he is the image. He is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, the word image here in the Greek has two meanings that that can be taken. One is the idea of representation. In other words, that the item that is being imaged is a symbol of the object, right? Like this photo. Can you throw this photo up for me? This is one of my favorite pictures of Al, one of our deacons. I just feel like it just captures Al. Just, just the, the happiness about him. I mean, I don't know what was going on with the Fu Manchu, but, but he's, just, he's just a happy guy, right? That, that's, that's an image going out. Now, Al's not here this morning, right? He's not present with us. It's, it's just a representation of Al. It symbolizes him in a way this morning, right? But it's not actually him. It's a, it's a separate idea, a separate photo, whatever you want to call it. it it's, it's not actually Al. It's not him. It just symbolizes him. But the second way in which the word is used in the Greek is that of manifestation. And what that means is the symbol brought with it the actual presence of the object. In other words, that Jesus was the actual presence of God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's not only the image of God, a representation, but he is God himself. And that is the way in which Paul is using this this word here, the way the song originally was using this word here in our text. Paul is intending to show that Jesus was not just a mere symbol. He wasn't just a mere picture or representation. He wasn't just an ambassador, but the actual presence of God himself in human form. And then he goes to the next description. And this is where I believe Arius gets off track with his idea of the firstborn of all creation. This is the text he would use to defend his position. And sure, the, the, the word firstborn, especially in the Old Testament, it's used 130 times. And the majority of those times in the Old Testament, it is used to denote birth order. In other words, that this would be the firstborn of a family. This would be the firstborn of cattle. There was, a, there was a kind of specialness in the Old Testament placed on the firstborn. But as you look at the word used in the New Testament, it's used eight times. And only two, or excuse me, and only one time is it there used with the idea of birth order attached to it. Because the understanding of firstborn changed over time. You familiar with that concept, right? If if I were to tell you, man, those shoes look bad. That means something different today than it did 20 years ago, right? 30, whatever. (laughs) Right? So, So words change over time. The usage of the word, the the concept of a word, right, begins to evolve. And so that's what we see in the New Testament. This, This word, they still use this word for an idea of specialness, but not literally being the firstborn, not literally being birth order, just being special. And even when you think about the Jewish idea of being the firstborn, so even if you want to try to go down the literal road with me, that wasn't necessarily 
the, the idea of the firstborn was not necessarily always the very first person born, right? Because if a girl was born first, she was not the firstborn. The firstborn was specifically for the male heir that was born. So the Jewish idea was that there is a, a preeminence to a certain person. That firstborn son would get half of the estate in the Old Testament. So just by being born first, he gets half of everything. All the other siblings have to divide the other half, the, the, the remaining half amongst themselves. Paul's focus here is not about literal birth order, but instead about preeminence. His Jesus' place in, in the world and in creation. And that's the way in which Paul is using the word here that Jesus Christ is preeminent. He's special. He's set apart. It's not about birth order. He's trying to connect Christ to creation. He's trying to set Christ above creation so that we will understand the relationship that Jesus has to this created world, that he is preeminent. He is special and set apart. And he has priority. And in this world, the, the meaning of privilege dominates this passage. It's hard to read the passage and take the literal use of the word of being firstborn and, and not just basically ignoring the context of the passage. The entire passage is setting Christ's preeminence, right? And so it's clear that Paul is using the word firstborn in the second sense of the word, the more figurative sense he is the special one. That he is above and separate from creation, and yet he is the one who is creating. And it is by him, through him, that all things are held together. He goes on in verse 16. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. Now there are two significant statements here in verse 17 that he is before all things. And clearly this comment has a time orientation to it. And it teaches that before creation Jesus existed. And that's important for us in our understanding of the priority of the person of Christ. That before creation, before us, he was. Second, in him, all things hold together. The work of creation included that continual sustaining of what was created. In other words, Jesus didn't just create it and walk away. He didn't just get the ball rolling and then say, hey, let's see where this goes. No. He not only created, created it, but he is sustaining it. He is sustaining the creation that he created. He's not an absentee landlord. He didn't just take his hands off the wheel. No, he, he is present. He is sustaining his creation. And we see this picture of Jesus being one who holds every aspect of creation together. And we know something about this creation because of the fall and because of conflict. We know that every aspect of creation has been touched by what? Sin. And that affects, the effects of the fall have marred the creation. The Bible tells us that creation excel, itself, the, the rocks cry out to be made right. That, th this wasn't just something that happened to us as human beings, that it, it infected the entire created order. And we also know that it is through one man that sin came into the world. And it is through one man that grace entered into the world. That every aspect of creation touched by sin will be touched by grace. In verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, but in everything, he might be preeminent. Again, we see this picture, this beautiful picture of Christ and his church. Now, I am struck, as I hope you are, 
by the organic nature of this description. Notice that it's not a picture of offices or buildings or structures, right? But instead, it's a body. There's a very organic nature to this new creation. We, we often in our minds start to think about church as, as, as these structures and these buildings, these offices. But Colossians, Paul's saying it's about a body. It's about a group of people. That is the temple. That is the body in which Jesus is the head of. And surely we know that Christ existed before creation, that the head can live without the body. It does not need us. But the picture being used is one of completion. When, when the body comes, the body surely can't exist without its head. It can't exist without Jesus Christ being a part of every aspect of its life. And the second thing we see is that he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Now, here we understand that redemption and grace from the beginning, <coughs> had, or excuse me, grace had a beginning, that while Jesus had no beginning, the idea of the church and redemption and grace does have a beginning. And that beginning is the cross. It is at that point in which we are made right. Right? That this is the point in which we are made. The point in which we intersect, our lives intersect with the cross of Jesus Christ. It is at that moment we have the opportunity for reconciliation with God. And there is a, a time element for our redemption. It has a beginning, and that beginning is with the resurrection. Again, we see Paul using the same word again. He is the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Again, Paul stressing this understanding to us of Christ, his positional place in the world. That whether in life or death, Christ is preeminent. He is is the most important thing. It goes on, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Paul's first claim in verse 19 is that Jesus was the fullness of God. That the full that God's fullness dwelt in him. And fullness being kind of a, a, a totality of God. This is enhanced in chapter 2, verse 9, where he says that Christ was a full measure of deity, helping us to remember and understand that he is not some created being. <coughs> As Arius suggested. He's not some firstborn. But instead, he is God himself. He is the very nature of God. And therefore, Jesus expresses God completely to us in human form. Everything that God is, Jesus is. But God is more, right? He is Father. He is Son. He is Spirit. Jesus is only one aspect of God, but he is every bit of God. God. In verse 20, Paul turns and looks at the work of Jesus. If this is who Jesus is, and, and this is what Jesus has done, that he is the author of creation, he is the one that sustains everything, why? Why does he do that? Verse 19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, the work of Jesus, the work of creation, is that reconciliation. The idea of reconciliation, although I'm going to talk about it this morning practically, 
through the idea of the relationships that we have in our lives. But, but listen, I want you to understand that that aspect of relational reconciliation is just one small aspect of what's happening here in this verse. But there's something much, much bigger happening in this text. Yes, Jesus died that we might be redeemed, that we might be reconciled to God first. That's way bigger than a peaceful Thanksgiving or Christmas. But even that is a small piece because here it says God is reconciling the entirety of creation, not just us. But the earth will be made right. Heaven will be made right. Everything will be reconciled. And those that accept this reconciliation, those that put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ are welcomed into the family of God. And those that are not will be separated from the family of God. This, this act of reconciliation is moving out into every aspect of the created world. And normally when we think about reconciliation, when we think about being reconciled with people, right? there, there are usually two prerequisites that have to happen to be reconciled. One, both parties must be willing. There must be a willingness to be reconciled. Second, there has to be an occasion that brings them together. Right? Two people who get into an argument and one lives in Germany and one lives in America and they don't ever see each other again. They don't have the opportunity to be reconciled. Right? They need to have some way of communicating to one another. So there has to be a willingness of both parties. There has to be an occasion that brings them together. Now, I would argue that with some of your family, you might not have willingness on both sides. But you do have some occasions coming up, right? So be praying for that willingness. And what's interesting in this passage is that we see that God has demonstrated His willingness and provided the occasion by taking the initiative to send Jesus the reconciler. That the work that God is doing in the world through Jesus Christ, His Son, that He took the initiative. This isn't a bunch of people on earth crying out to God saying, please reconcile us. No, this is God taking the initiative. He took the first step. Remember when I said we should model the person responsible for the peace we have. That means you should also be the one to take the first step. I hear so many people say, well, I will if they will. Yeah. If we're going to model the master reconciler, he didn't, he didn't wait. He took the initiative. He took the first step. Jesus left heaven, came to earth to reconcile us back to himself. He took the initiative. He was the one that took the first step. But not only that, we see in this passage that this is involving more than voluntary movement. The, the natural creation was subjected to him, not, not by its choice. Roman 8 says that its reconciliation will be uh, God's choosing in his time. How does he do that? How does, how does he reconcile us? We see it here at the end of verse 20, by the blood of his cross. This is the picture and theology of blood atonement which runs throughout the Old, the Old Testament. And it speaks to the radical death of Jesus Christ. Ultimately, throughout the Old Testament, there was this idea of a need for a blood atonement to cover sin. And all of that, Hebrew says, was just a shadow pointing to the ultimate atonement, the ultimate sacrifice to cover the sin of the world. That was going to be made on man's behalf through the Son, Jesus Christ. His atonement achieved peace for us. And what's interesting to me about this, because I, I think most of us here 
when we talk about peace, what you're really thinking about are your feelings. And what I mean is that in certain situations, you want to feel that there is a peace. Right? And the peace is just the absence. Like, we just, I don't want to argue today. Can we just eat a Christmas ham and not argue? But what Jesus Christ's blood on the cross did was an objective peace. It's not about feelings. It's about a new reality. And whether I feel it or not, God has made that peace clear. How? Through the blood on the cross. That, that Jesus has come to bring actual peace. Peace between man and God. I think that's important <clears throat> because as Christians, as a Christian, there are a lot of times that I don't always feel that peace. But that doesn't negate the fact that peace is real. My feelings do not control God. My feelings do not control God's peace. Because Jesus came and he died, he made peace for us. Period. End of sentence. Now here's the reality. When our relationships are right, the feelings will follow. And God, knowing that, sent Jesus Christ to give us objective peace. We, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have accepted this free gift by faith of Jesus reconciling you to God on the cross, you have this objective peace. And the feelings will follow. As we understand our right relationship with Jesus Christ, we will feel more and more and more peace. But the reality is, we already have it. It doesn't matter how you feel. We already have that peace. And that's amazing to me, because I'm going to be honest with you, I don't always feel it. In fact, there's a lot of days I struggle with it. What, why would you save me? Why would you want me? I'm so messed up. I, I, I did the same dumb thing again, God. And yet, because of the blood of the cross, I know objectively I am at peace with God. I may not feel it, but the more I dwell on the fact that I have been made right, <clears throat> right, the more I will feel it. And the same is true in our human relationships. When we choose to objectively make peace, it doesn't mean we're going to feel better about the person. Matter of fact, I can tell you firsthand, it will not make you feel better about the person. It doesn't mean that our feelings of annoyance or frustration or anger just automatically, completely go away. But the more we understand that our objective relationship is one made of peace, then we will begin to feel differently for them when the relationships are correct. And at peace, when we are at peace, the feelings will follow. This peace that Jesus Christ made was to individuals. In Romans 5, though, we also see, uh, we see that immediate result was justification. That, that when we put our faith and our trust in him, we are immediately justified. And we are immediately made right. Not perfect, not sinless, but we are justified. We are made right in our relationship with God. But we also see this applied corporately in Ephesians 2, where peace between races was a result of the work of Christ. 
that we as human beings, as a larger group of people, are being reconciled because of the work of the cross when we are being conformed into God's chosen people. Not God's chosen white people, not God's chosen Hispanic people, but God's chosen people. Jews, Gentiles, free, and slaves. It doesn't matter, the human classification. What matters is the new classification of being God's people. We see that referred to in the Old Testament in Israel, right? So we have this individual, but we also have this corporate reconciliation we see in the work of the cross. And so Paul has two basic reference points when it comes to this discussion on reconciliation. First was the beginning of restoration which occurred at the cross. The death of Christ provided the objective basis upon which all else follows. This Paul looked backwards in time, resting his hope on what was done through Christ. Second was the culmination of reconciliation which will take place in the future. So Paul's looking back to the foundation, to where it started, but he's also looking forward to the future. Paul expressed by faith the necessary outworking of the death of Jesus. Thus, Jesus, not only um, his death, not only provided individuals with salvation, but also to restore the harmony of the entire universe. Every aspect of creation. Harmony that is assured is an assured aspect of redemption. If you want to look at verse 20, he says, making peace by the blood of his cross. I want you to think for a minute how costly that peace was to God. It wasn't cheap. He didn't send a surrogate. He didn't send a representative. He sent himself. Not only is it expensive, this peace, but I want you to understand how important it is to God. He sent himself. Jesus was the one that came and paid for the peace. Entering into humanity, taking on flesh for us. It was that important to God that peace be made. God is passionate about peace all of creation is ultimately about jesus he says that in this passage that it was created by him or through him by him and for him and that he is the goal of this peace and reconciliation when we when you think about the word peace at the very center of that you should think about jesus he is the point. Real peace can only be found through the cross of Jesus Christ. Everything else is momentary and fleeting. It might be a feeling of peace, but it's not actually objective peace. The only place to find objective peace and right standing with God is through the blood of of the cross of Jesus Christ. I hope you understand. I hope you feel the importance of it this morning. I hope you feel the importance that God places on peace. And the reason why I'm kind of belaboring the point a little bit here at the end is because as we go through this series, Peace on Earth, you're going to be challenged. You're going to be challenged to live differently. You have to understand the importance to to, to really accept and understand and, and respond to that challenge. It can't just be me or Jamie or whoever preaching telling you to live differently. That's not enough. That's not enough motivation. That's not going to make it happen in your life. You have to understand the importance that peace has to God. You have to understand the price that God has paid for peace. 
Because I believe that when you begin to fully understand the importance of peace in relationship to Jesus Christ, then as a follower, as a person who claims to follow Jesus Christ, that will change your behavior. And some of the ways that you've been dealing with conflict, maybe your whole life up to this point, you will finally allow him to challenge as we go through this series and to change. Because before we can be, begin to be agents of peace, before we can begin to bring peace into our world, which is one of the things that in Matthew that we are called to be as we follow Jesus, the ultimate peacemaker, we have to grasp the peace that he has given to us. Folks, it is impossible for you to give something you do not have. It is impossible. You cannot do it. You, you cannot extend a peace that you do not have yourself. You need that object, objective peace in your life. And maybe for some of you this morning, you're the opposite of a peacemaker. You're a troublemaker. But you claim to follow Jesus. And I just want to challenge you this morning, which Jesus are you following? Because maybe the reason you haven't been able to give peace, but instead just trouble, is because you're not following the Prince of Peace. You've created this idea of your own Jesus. We have to grasp the peace that was given to us. It is impossible to give something that we don't have. Now the reality is because of the justification of Christ, we have it. But I don't think most of us grasp it. I don't think most of us really feel the weight of it. I think many of us are like the servant who had been forgiven of the million dollar debt that can't seem to forgive a thousand dollar debt. Why? Because he doesn't grasp what he's been forgiven of. And the very first place we have to start in peacemaking is understanding the importance of peace to God. And the price that he paid for this morning as we prepare our hearts for a time of repentance and we take the Lord's Supper and we remember the blood of the cross that was shared so that we might have peace. I want to challenge you this morning to Look at conflict as something that is not negative. Not something bad, not something to be avoided. But instead, I want you to begin to look at conflict as an opportunity to show people how to find real peace. Because we have to have this understanding of conflict and the ability to see it through the lens of grace that's been extended to us for us to become agents of peace. That way we'll stop running from conflict and instead start running to it. So as we have this time today, I just want to read a couple of questions and a couple of passages and ask you some to, to just reflect on them. So if you would, just, just take a moment, bow your heads, close your eyes, and, and I just want you to listen. I don't want you to be distracted. before we participate in the Lord's Supper, before you come and take of the bread that was God's body broken for you and dip it into the wine that represents his blood. I just want to ask yourself, I want you to ask yourself a couple of questions. Is this love for peace that Jesus has living in me? Is this love for peace that Jesus has living in me? in me? Am I as passionate about peace and reconciliation as God is? And will I pay the price required to spread peace and reconciliation with others? As God has paid that price for me. First Peter, it says to humble yourself under God's mighty hand. 
This morning, will you humble yourself and stop trying to prove your own righteousness? This morning, will you cast aside your lifelong tactics for resolving conflict and follow God's path for making peace, no matter how difficult it may be? In Matthew 7, it says, how do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and not pay attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This morning, will you stop dwelling on what others have done wrong and confess that in detail? Confess how you have contributed to the conflict or a broken relationship. In Philippians 2, Paul says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. This morning, will you admit that others may understand a conflict situation more accurately than you do? Will you give as much effort to identifying and meeting their interest as you do your own? In Ephesians 4, Paul writes, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. What about that person who has deeply wronged you? That person that's gossiped about you, betrayed your trust, failed to keep a commitment, maybe damaged your property or your reputation? What price will you pay to encourage that person's repentance and restore peace in your relationship? Will you let go of bitterness? Will you give up self-pity? Will you divest yourself of the desire to make the person suffer for the wrong that he or she has done to you? Again, I ask you, will you pay the price required to spread peace and reconciliation with others as God has paid for you? Father, as we enter into this time of celebrating your resolution to our conflict, may we come this morning with a new appreciation, feeling the weight of the price that you paid but also with praise, Lord. Praise that we serve a God that cares so much about peace and reconciliation that he paid the price, that he took the first step, that you initiated the reconciliation. May we feel the weight and celebration of that this morning as we come.